good evening, everybody. Um, I am Scott Marble. I am the chair of the School of Architecture uh, at Georgia Tech. I was going to say here at Georgia Tech, but when I say here, everybody's in a different place. So uh, anyway, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We have a great lecture. Uh, 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 we're very uh, excited about that. Um, this is the uh, annual Douglas C. Allen lecture. Uh, and this lecture is in honor of Doug, who was uh, an influential professor, um, a cherished colleague, and, and for many years, uh, a big part of the uh, then College of Architecture. Um, for the students that have joined us who probably might not have heard of Doug, he was a landscape architect and an educator who was at Georgia Tech for, I believe, 35 or 37 years. Uh, he was a teacher, administrative, played administrative roles, and who really had an incredibly lasting impact on the school and on many of the faculty who are, are still here at the school. Uh, and his legacy lives on in many ways, including this lecture, uh, but also in the course that he developed uh, when he was here, uh, now being taught by Richard Dagenhart called The History of Urban Form. And that continues to be one of the most popular courses in our uh, curriculum. Uh, so we're, uh, we're, this is a very uh, exciting lecture, and, it, and it's one of our kind of uh, flagship lectures of the year. We're super uh, happy and fortunate uh, to have Walter Hood here uh, tonight to talk about his work. Uh, Walter is the creative director uh, and the founder of Hood Design Studio in Oakland, California. Um, and his work, I, I encourage you just, I mean, you'll, you'll, he'll talk about his work tonight, but I would also spend some time on his webpage and just, and just really study his work. It's, it's quite amazing and uh, rich. Um, it, it merges art, landscape, architecture, urbanism, and is really driven by kind of a deep engagement with his clients, with the communities that he works in, and with the specifics that, uh, of each of the projects uh, that, that their practice takes on. Um, like a lot of people, he practices, but he also teaches. Uh, he's the David K. Wu Chair and Professor of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and Walter also goes on the circuit uh, quite, a quite a lot, and last year was the Diana Balmori Visiting Professor at Yale School of Architecture. Um, I won't go into his, entire, his incredible list of awards and publications and all, just, just to mention a few. Uh, he's definitely, he's been recognized as really some of the most prestigious awards in our, in, our, in our discipline, and many of them very recently. I mean, I feel like every time I, I check my, my uh, Instagram feed or my email, there's another award that, that Walter has won. But these include the, a Knight Foundation Public Spaces Fellowship, a MacArthur Fellowship, uh, Dorothy and Lillian Gish Prize, and just last week, the most recent announcement that I got was that he was uh, selected as a member to the 2021 20, uh, class of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, with a very impressive list of, of colleagues. Um, um, he's also part of uh, a historic, what I consider to be a historic exhibition currently on view at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, titled Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America, uh, which I was fortunate enough to actually see this past week. Um, and in this show, he, uh, each of the contributors worked on a different city, and Walter worked in Oakland, where his office is located. And he, he did a project that imagined uh, new kind of fictions that he, he referred to them, kind of speculative urban landscape for 10 sites along a strip uh, of San Pablo Avenue in Oakland, um, uh, an area that suffered from a history of disinvestment resulting from uh, uh, racially defined federal redlining policies and planning uh, over many years. Uh, and these, his, his work is presented through and depicted through a series of large-scale models and drawings uh, that are kind of watercolors and ink drawings are quite amazing. Uh, but they're also quite demanding, I think, in their message. And I was just talking to Walter before we got on that, you know, I found myself just circling back around to the work to, to, to absorb it and to engage it and to, and to kind of reflect on it. It's a very powerful exhibition. Uh, Walter's contribution to the exhibition is, is incredibly powerful, and I encourage everybody to, to visit that if you can at some point. Um, 
so Walter, we're thrilled to have you here. We're thrilled, thrilled to welcome you as our uh, 2021 uh, Douglas C. Allen lecturer. So I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Scott. And um, it looks like, you know, ear, earphones are in vogue these <laughs> years. Well, you have the headless ones silver, or the cordless. I got my silver ones on. Yeah, you got to get the cordless. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a pleasure uh, to be back in Atlanta. Uh, I'm going to try to share my screen right now. Um, can you see my screen, Scott? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Share the screen. Okay. Technology. There it comes. Okay. How about that? That's good. You're st you, you you like go to full pres presentation mode. Um, yeah. Am perfect. I there now? There you're okay. there. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Again, it's a pleasure uh, to be at Georgia Tech virtually. Uh, I hope everyone's doing well during these trying times. Uh, before I start my lecture, though, I'd like to sort of send my uh, deepest uh, sympathies to the city of Atlanta uh, for, you know, the past few days and the events that have uh, happened there, like it's happening in many other places. Here in Oakland, we're experiencing some of the same issues uh, that are driven by race in a civil accord. Uh, but with that, I'd like to talk tonight, uh, particularly about the subject of, of landscapes and black landscapes. I'm gonna do a little quick pitch out for my book, Black Landscapes Matter, uh, which was just published and now we're in our third printing. Uh, the book though is not about this current post-colonial moment. It actually came about four years ago in 2016 after the Mike Brown a shooting and uh, we held a colloquium at Berkeley and so this is the result of that. But tonight I'd like to, you know, talk about this idea though of the black landscape, but not just by looking at black landscapes, but trying to kind of think about how do we reconcile this duality that we have in this country, this duality between whiteness and color. Um, I love this um, cartoon because I think it was part of a New York Times article that stated that it was not about busing. Busing was not about, you know, um, getting people to go to school. It was really about trying to integrate our society. And if we look back at our history, this notion of integration, we've only been trying to do it for a very short time, and that would be the green portion on the right-hand side. So again, when we're thinking about, you know, that we're in a post-racial society that we've made it, we have a lot of work to do because we're just beginning. For a course that I taught last semester uh, on post-colonialism, we made a very simple timeline that was based on the 16-7 um, lineage. And we were looking at just all of these amazing uh, developments in landscape architecture that begin to define our profession and that our profession is kind of steeped in this colonial history. But how do we deal with this idea that certain groups of people were isolated, excluded, partitioned, and even given duplicated landscapes while others who were privileged had a chance to reap the benefits of modernism, of change that was actually happening in the world. But around us, we've always known that our landscapes have been highly racialized. You can look at a sandbar map and you can actually find it. You can find Negro schools, you can find Asian neighborhoods and things like that. And so as part of cartography, as part of just a record, race is always there with us. And even during the 20th century, during Jim Crow, this notion of creating this duality, it created a semiotic, a semiotic that some would argue is still part of our memory or the way we look at nature, the way we look at architecture, those codes are still there. And we are aware, highly aware of that. We have examples from the last year a photographer in Central Park, you know, a black person, right, in nature is still looked at in a very different way. And then these ideas, you know, permeate. I was from North Carolina, Charlotte, and my um, relatives lived in the rural area of North Carolina, but I was taken by my grandmother always talking about Black Saturday. Black Saturday was the only time that blacks would actually go into town and actually shop. But as you sort of see, there was no white people here, but that was the day they took off. And as part of my own memory, as a young kid in the rural part of North Carolina, these signs like this was all too frequent. And these signs did more than just create a semiotic. They actually created a psychology, a psychology of trauma that people are still dealing with. 
And even in our current contemporary moment, some of these ideas, they get popularized and we forget, right, what those spaces were really like. And here with the Green Book, which was really more about black people in the diaspora of the U.S., in the popular culture, the black person is still sitting towards the back. And so as this black semiotic has developed throughout the universe, throughout the United States, you know, we have to ask the question, you know, this is not, you know, the backdrop, right, for people of color. This was actually planned. But when you hear about a lot of the shootings and things that have transpired in this country uh, over the last decade or so, the semiotic is always the same. He was leaving the liquor store. He was walking down the street in the middle of the street. You never hear about someone walking down a tree line Elm Street in a single family residential neighborhood, right? So the semiotic is always the same and we know how it always ends. In each one of these moments that we find, there's always been a rebellion, a rebellion against the kind of, oh, how can I say, separated, excluded, impoverished landscape. So in the last year, we've seen civic leaders actually lead the way. Your leader down in Atlanta, as well as the mayor in um, Washington, D.C., lead the way to try to change that semiotic. But what happens when a different rally cry comes out? You know, blackness in the landscape. I just remember seeing people, whites, going out and erasing the blackness. But we have to remember, as part of the 20th century, whiteness was allowed. Whites only was the semiotic. But all of a sudden, now you have this duality rise up. And all of a sudden, there's a backlash to it. So this is the place of reconciliation. And I'm reminded of growing up in Charlotte, North Carolina in the late 70s when we had to choose a gateway and we chose Pomodora. I didn't choose it, but the city fathers did. And Pomodora designed this huge disc. They talked about the independence of a changing dynamic city and that was Charlotte. And I was, I had always remembered Pomodora. And when I went out into the world, I saw more of these and I felt proud that my city had embraced this modern art, but in a way was embracing a modern future. But recently going back to Charlotte, I noticed that in that same place, they had erected a new origin story, one that talked about a more ostensible past and one that actually featured a black person with a hammer. And I was taken by this because I know Charlotte was settled in 1750. And I wondered, I know we're below the Mason-Dixon line, I mean, how many slaves were there really in Charlotte or in North Carolina? And there were some free people, but there was also slaves. And so these ideas of origin, meaning, who begins to define those things? Again, these are questions that I think we have to begin to debate. And so as early as the late uh, 20th century, I've worked on projects. This is Macon, Georgia. Um, we finished Macon, Georgia, the turn of the millennium. And this is the Daughters of the Fed Confederacy uh, obelisk. Uh, back then, this landscape, this was a competition through the Mayor's Institute. And we actually cleaned the area off around the obelisk and made a fountain for the obelisk. At that point in time, we were trying to call attention to the Confederacy, not remove it. We actually placed precast bales of cotton in the same space to create this diametrically opposed sort of reality. Today, during the George Floyd moment, they're calling for the, the obelisk to come down if it hasn't come down already, and they're redoing this landscape. There are new semiotics popping up in Charleston, South Carolina. This is a bench by the road by Toni Morrison after she wrote Beloved. She came up with this amazing statement that there's no place for her to sit in the U.S. and think about her ancestors. This is Denmark Vesey on the right, a statue that was erected again about 15 years ago in Charleston in Hampton Park. But none of these places sit in that historic district. They sit outside. Our work that we've worked on, we've tried to put black people out in the front. Those everyday patterns and practices at like Lafayette Square, where we fundraised to have a bathroom where people could come and get their haircuts, where young little small black kids would have a place to play. But in a different kind of compositional landscape, we try to talk about the history that blackness has always been here and that we could still create spaces that welcome people. 20 years later, Lafayette Square is still there. 
it's a place where people still can come together. We have a moment now where we have homelessness, and there have been tents set up in Lafayette Square. But we welcome that because we design for it. That's the reason why we have the restroom. That's the reason why we have the barbecues and other things. But at the same time, the more popular culture is asking to remove those people. And again, they don't remember because they were not part of that process. But the semiotics of space is really important. When you see yourself in a space, or when you see your heroes in a space, it can author and give you a power, a power to actually reflect upon your own self and begin to think about a different future, a future that is not just based on probabilities, but based on possibilities, that it couldn't give you strength to go on to see Malcolm, to see Martin, to see Maya, to see Barack, right, at this other scale in space. But it's also a place where we're triggered by the trauma in places where the National Guards have come into our neighborhoods, where there has been this civil strife, where the architecture has actually been seen as something that we could actually erase and rebuild anew without our memory. But this one project at the Bayview Opera House, instead we fought right, to clean up the building and keep it for our young black kids, these young thespians. And through just thinking about ADA, we asked a different question. Can we actually make a site accessible so that during most of the time, people are welcome here and not closed out? In Nashville, a small maker competition, you know, allowed us to witness the Nashville civil rights. I went to an HBCU in Greensboro, North Carolina A&T, and I thought our Woolworth exploits led the way. But working here in Nashville, we found a different set of stories. In witness walls, we wanted to sort of manifest a space that takes a fallow edge of City Hall and turns it into a place where you can sit and think about your ancestors. And by going back and mining some of the images from the collection, from the newspaper that was found, these were never published. We were drawn to these images of young kids and women who had to sort of exist within this white landscape to ask for a black landscape. And even some of the images of incarceration, as one young woman asked me, Mr. Hood, is this Ferguson? And I said, no, this is 1968 Nashville. But taking these images, we wanted the walls to speak, right, of a modern time. So using concrete, we embedded the images on one side, like these large scale prints, we embedded images of women, and young children fighting the good fight on one side and on the other side, real photo etched images. But we wanted the wall to be tactile, music plays as you sit and as you think about the exploits of our ancestors, hopefully you're empowered. You begin to sort of understand the semiotic of a city. As we, the wall went up, people started to talk about joys. They started to remember the places, the places in which people participated. And on the other side, as we've etched the images into the concrete, when there's no light, there's just surface. But as the light comes, the images emerge out and they tell a different story. And the walls are seen, again, as a way of constantly putting ourselves out in space, but changing the semiotics, the signs and symbols about how we think about the city and how we think about ourselves. It's a place of memory, but also a place for the future. And here on opening day, the young man on the right, his name is Freddie, he comes up to me and he says, Walter, that's me. And during the entire process, Freddie never mentioned that he was in that image. And again, I think that's something to learn in this new age of me taking pictures on the Instagram, sending things out, posting things, that a lot of things that we do we can be silent about them because those could be most powerful. This next project is in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, this is Catherine Foster's homestead. As the University of Virginia was expanding its north lawn south, of, they found a community that was called Canada, and they found that there were remains interned into a site. And the site was home to Kitty Foster. And it turns out she was one of the first free black women to own land in the area. And she did the clothing for the boys. UVA was an all boys school. 
So I asked if I could take on this project being part of a larger team with Cheryl Barton to take on this exhumy and how could we actually talk about Kitty Foster? How could we talk about this landscape in the shadow of Jefferson? And what I came up with was this idea of a shadow catcher, the notion that light and shadow, right, are, is the way that we in turn, but it's also a way through the spirit that we rise. And this idea in archaeology that we don't really know what's beneath the ground, but we can set up a grid to actually locate things. And so the shadow catcher casts a grid out over the landscape when there is light. And when there is light and shadow, the spirit gets a ride to heaven, flash of the spirit. And this notion of coming into a site and pertaining into a ritual, when there's a shadow, you are forced to look down. And when there's light, you're forced to look up. But it's that zeitgeist, that play between the two for us that creates the spirituality of space, but also an abstraction that begins to force you to kind of think about life and death, beauty, color, place, etc. And as you move around the site, we make sure that the spaces and how they're designed is very different than the core of the university. Pathways are small, more meandering, and we'd isolate and locate different things of historic record, like uh, the pond, I mean, the well, and some of the other artifacts. And to the lower part of the site is where we re uh the bodies that were found, but we created a sculptural ground plane that's reminiscent of historic grave sites in Virginia where people are buried in wooden caskets and their bodies are allowed to decompose. And ringing that cemetery is a stone wall, again, reminiscent of that historic past around it, where you can come again and think about those who came before you. If, as an African American, I can articulate what W.E.B. Du Bois talks about as double consciousness or the veil in which we wear and take the veil off and actually try to define ourselves through a different subject. It's also, I think, our mission, all of us, to begin to define the other side, and that's whiteness. At Princeton, Double Sites attempts to do that. This was a competition. Um, three firms were shortlisted and invited to participate, and my studio won. The basic brief was Woodrow Wilson, the president, former president of the United States and of the university, had a good side and a bad side. The piece should articulate that. I was taken by the brief wanting to create this duality. So we chose one to listen to the students because the students on one hand had asked that they remove the name of Woodrow Wilson from the wall to the president. And they had asked for that to happen. They didn't want a competition to happen. So we started out looking at Wilson. Wilson's a Southern man. I think his father was a preacher. He moves north and he's teaching in the Northeast before he ends up in Princeton. But I wanted to find a different way to interrogate Wilson. And so we chose the words of DuBose and the idea, again, of the double consciousness that those of us who have to deal with the double versus those of us who are privileged to not and Wilson was privileged to not. So on the campus, to the north, at the center of campus, the site is located. And here you have the Fountain of Freedom for James Fitzgerald and the Rothschild trees. And these are both gifts within the space. This is almost, this is like the town hall of Princeton, the city where town and gown meet together. And the idea was very simple, was to take a black column and it supports a white column. If you take a square and cut a square at the diagonal, which we did, and make them two, that diagonal cut, the hypotenuse, is actually the longer side, and that's the inside. And there, what we wanted to do was to hear the voices of his contemporaries in the apex of the piece. And standing in the apex, you will hear the voices of DuBose, the voices of Booker T, of Trotter, pushing almost as if they are conscious to Wilson, pushing him to be a better man. It sits at the same height as the building itself, 39 feet. 
two of the trees from the Rothschild are removed and double sites is placed down between. In some of the words by his contemporaries, have you a new freedom for white Americans and a new slavery for your African-American fellow citizen? The white people of this country once sewed slave pens, bull whips, auction blocks, and handcuffs and reaped a rebellion. So they're asking him, they want to be treated as men. They want to be treated as women. And then on the outside, we take quotes by Wilson himself on education, labor, foreign policy, women's suffrage, race, and civil liberties. And we place that on the outside, on the smaller sides. And so then we have this new gateway where you have the fountain of freedom and this new open site in which we now can think of the issues that reverberate with these dualities. The piece is highly reflective. We use glass stone as a surface treatment, and so it reflects its surrounding almost like a kaleidoscope. And Wilson's words are etched on the black and white, but they're small that you have to go up to them. But what takes the show is his contemporaries on the inside, because on one side they're reflective, and on the other side, there are lenticular images of all the people that we have, their words. And at night, the inside lights up as the outside is muted. And here you can kind of see the text etched lightly against the reflective stainless on the inside. We wanted the piece to force you again to look up to the sky because that's his contemporaries getting you to be a better person. This piece takes a while to immerse yourself in. And the idea is that students walk past, maybe they will read a quote. They'll read on the black side, they'll read on the white side, they'll look at something from the inside. And then at night, they will see those voices, they will see those faces of Ida B. Wells, Booker T. Washington, and others. And as the lenticular changes, you move from one side to the other, and the images change. And the images are meant to sort of give the piece variety as you're moving by, so it's never the same every time you go by. How, must, how long must we wait for liberty, Mr. President? What will you do for women's suffrage? And again, we're taken by images of the women's suffrage movement waiting outside the gates of the White House as Wilson did nothing. And we, last two years ago, I guess it's right before COVID hit, uh, we had a groundbreaking. And the groundbreaking was like no other I had participated in. The president came out, and this was during Black Student Union Week, and the students rallied. So this was actually a space in which people could contest, where people could talk, and it was a racially integrated space. This past summer, I got a call from the president of the school. And she said, Walter, we're removing the name of Woodrow Wilson. And she said one of the trustees had gone out and read some of the text from the piece and was so moved that she voted to remove the name. And I don't know if the piece, you know, should be celebrated for moving people a certain way. The piece does reach, have a great reach. I look at the piece as something that could be permanent or temporary, but it is something of this moment. Next project is in the Low Country, it's in Charleston, South Carolina. I've been working down here now about 15 years. Uh, as I was raised in North Carolina, we never went to South Carolina. There was um, a different view of the Geechees of the South. But as I started to get acquainted with Charleston through Spoleto, I started to gain much more of an interest in this different River Rhine landscape as opposed to the Piedmont that I came from. I mean, I knew the Gullah Geechee, I knew rice was a big thing in South Carolina, but not until working here in Charleston did I know about Carolina Gold. This is an installation called Rice Table where we grew rice, me and four other artists, for three months during Spoleto. And we actually created a wetland, a wetland right in the middle of Charleston next to the Memminger Theater. 
and then we held rice celebrations and rituals during the summer months. One of the first times I created, have created an ecology out of elements because within a month we had frogs, we had blue herrings, we had birds, we had things. And these trees are pre-existing, but we changed the asphalt ground into something wet, into something murky, into something changing. The next project I'd like to share with you is in Charleston and it's called Our Ancestors Garden and it's located at what we call the New International African American Museum. It's going to be a center where families will learn about and appreciate American history, but more important, the low country of Charleston. It's located next to, if you've been to Charleston, it will be next to the aquarium. It's where you'll be able to take a boat and actually go out to Fort Moultrie, as some do or go out and look at the other civil rights sites. It's also a space that's very close to Mother Emanuel Church, where the massacre happened a few years ago, where nine members of the congregation were killed by a 21-year-old white male from, Charlotte, from North Carolina. So we find that, again, the history of the site is charged. This is a place where, called Gadsden's Wharf. It's a place that has been recently exhumed one that had been forgotten, a place where we think more than 40% of the African slave diaspora actually landed. It's where many of our ancestors perished and were sold off. We were able to locate and define where that line existed. The architect for the project is the late Harry Cobb of Pay Cobb and Freed. Uh, and Harry, I would have to say, is one of the most eloquent and most powerful architects I've ever had the chance to work with. He was regal. He really believed in the spirit of architecture. So for this building, he called me and said, Walter, I'm working on a very important project and we need your help. It's all about landscape. And the way he described the building, he said he didn't want the building to be rhetorical. He wanted the building, the building had to sit up since this is a hurricane zone, but he wanted the landscape and the structure to be really, really important and powerful. So Guy Nordenson is doing the structural engineer. The building is as long as a football pitch. It's uh, 100 meters long. It sits up 13 feet. Uh, it's a very simple brick building that looks out towards the harbor and the Atlantic Ocean and looks back towards the city. So it has this duality already built into it where land and sea are really important. We were asked to do a commemorative garden, and we were inspired by the sky again and the figure of the black body. So in the site plan, as you sort of see to the north, the black columns are the building, so the building will sit where the black columns are. To the north, we've tried to create a low country garden that starts out with sweet grass, and as you make your way under the building, they become more parterred gardens that are ethnobotanical, rice gardens, and moss gardens that, you, that literally hug you. And then as you move to the south, you, in, you, you inquire and experience the, um, the warehouse wall where the slaves were actually stored. There's a palm grove that will have sounds African voices talking to you as you're looking back out towards the Atlantic Ocean. The other piece to this landscape that we fought for is to not put a wall or gates around it. And during these trying times, one can imagine from the municipality and others to protect this place. But we argue that this is like other places in Charleston, in the historic core of Charleston. They're like the cemeteries that you can walk through. They're ghost tours that happen at night in Charleston. So we want this place to be part of that experience. We don't want this black landscape to, again, to be pushed out and not be part of this local narrative. So as you make your way from the city into the museum, we've reconstructed what we're calling these primary dunes. And the dunes are that beginning of coming to the waterfront. And as you look back out towards the city, the dunes create this kind of enclosure, but they also create this juxtaposition with the ground plane and the columns. The ground is made of shells. The columns are made of shells. Tabby, which is a, a local um, sort of pavement art form that's gone back hundreds of years. And in a way, it's a metaphor for the Atlantic Ocean. All of the shells have been collected from the floor of the harbor and the ocean. 
as you make your way from the north, here's the sweet grass garden that takes you through this immersive experience of sweet grass, which is a plant that is actually, um, I think now a lot of the basket makers have to travel all the way down to Georgia just to get sweet grass because of the suburbanization that's happening here in Charleston. There's a Stele garden, very similar to Middleton Place. We've created a set of garden experiences. So the first one's a stele garden where we have stones and stones will actually talk about the different tribes from West Oakland that came to this area. An ethnobotanical garden where this will be a temporary garden that's in constant flux because we are again at an edge that couldn't be impacted by weather. And so this gives the curators ways in which to change the ethnobotanic garden or what we call the rice planters inspired by uh, the rice table, but these planters that hold water that will allow rice to propagate seasonally. And then as you look from the floor south, the wall will be ablaze from the sun. And we have Ma Angelou's quotes, uh, I am the son of a slave. I rise and still I rise along this entire wall. And as you make your way through, there's a series of sculptures that emulate or recall the rice negro, which was in West Africa, planters were looking for young boys to stand in the water who would not attract malaria. And so during the day, you'll walk through this reflective corridor in coming face to face with figures. And at night, again, looking back towards the harbor, you will have that same experience. We're looking at just different ways in which to sculpt these. Will they be upright? The one in the middle suggests maybe there might be carcasses outlaid, but that's something that we're studying right now. And then lastly, as part of an experience of Fort Moultrie, I came upon the Brooks maps, which is a map showing the Brooks ship uh, that came, I think it made 11 voyages, uh, so a Dutch ship. Uh, but this is a lithograph that described what was happening down below in the hole. And as we know, head to toe, head to toe, women on one side, men on the other side, children in the middle. Each person, each human was given, you know, two meters or a meter and three quarters. I think it's five feet and six feet. And I think the kids were given six feet. Uh, but we know the shifts were even packed even denser than this. And so out at Fort Moultrie, there's a copy of the Brooks map, but it looked like a Xerox copy, but I was taken by uh, the quality of the image, which again had a negative impact on me, but it was also a conceptual idea that I used to begin to riff off of the notion of having bodies on the ground that could emulate and begin to suggest a relationship to the ships that bought slaves to this place. And so working with Paycop Freed, we created this infinity fountain. And you probably know most infinity fountains are places where you see kids running through splashing water because there's only that much water in it. But here, the ground plane will be different. It will be where the figure gets exhumed and the shells actually, again, from the sea, begin to mark those bodies. And as it fills up with water, we want the shales to have this kind of quality that will force you to actually look at water and look at the harbor in a completely different way. And through this kind of serial nature, create the head to toe figures. The little video I recently got that shows how the light across the figures So that light is being caught by the shells. And so we're really excited by when the shells are turned on the other side, the light refracts across it. So we think the lighting across these bodies will begin to evoke this kind of power, power of exhuming the past. And along the stainless steel line, as you're looking back out, the fountain will fill up and then it'll drain out. And since it's at an angle, the drain will always, there will always be water at the feet and the head of the figure. So there will always be water. There's this kind of abstraction, again, that forces you to recall our ancestors as you're looking out to Charleston Harbor and then out to Africa. And then in closing, I think this idea of memory, 
can really be powerful if we begin to sort of challenge, again, the dualities that exist around us. For the Chicago Biennale a few years ago, I think it's two years now, um, I was asked to, if I would do a piece inside of the Chicago library's uh, courtyard, and it was really restrictful. But as I was researching it, I came across an article that was condemning Obama's library that Todd and Billy are currently designing that they're tearing down trees in Washington and Jefferson Park. And there was no mention that Washington and Jefferson were presidents, and there was just another president going to be making a space in the place where other presidents were. So I wanted to recycle those trees and then create three presidents or three trees inside the courtyard. So we have Washington, Jefferson, and Obama. And before I close, I think I have a short video clip uh, that's a prelude to the show in MoMA that I wanted to sort of share before we went into questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Walter. <clears throat> I'll turn my camera back on now. And I'll stop sharing. <laughs> uh, let's stop. There we go. Whew. Yeah. Hopefully that wasn't too fast. <laughs> no, that was that was perfect. Perfect. It was good timing. And yeah. I encourage I encourage everybody to you know uh, put your questions or comments or whatever into the Q&A section. We have a couple of questions right now, but uh, I'm assuming there'll be there'll be quite a few more. Um, so Walter, uh, that was a story. That was that was like a story of, of 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 your of your work. I mean, it was just such an interesting and uh, uh, powerful way to present your work. Um, have to make these things like interesting for me, man. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm finding that in Zoom, you know, you can be a little bit more uh, reflective, more introspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's just different audience, too, you know, and it's like I am I was really encouraged to talk to you guys because you guys are in the south. You're in a different place, you know, than someone if I was talking to in Canada. Right. Uh, and I wanted to really, you know, talk about my own personal experiences, you know, dealing with this kind of the semiotics around us. Uh, and when I was talking about Macon, I didn't even mention in Macon, you know, and I had to go back and look. It was 1999. I was actually blackfaced in the club in Macon. Right. Oh and gosh. the mayor at the time, um, the mayor was the senator. I think con Congressman uh, Jim uh, Marshall and his secretary had taken her daughter to a play or something at the club. And some guy came out, she said, with a mop on his head, black face and a Hawaiian shirt because I had just won the competition. I was like, hi, I'm this professor from UC Berkeley. You know, I mean, it was like and this is 1999. Right. And I remember. I had a student working for me from the University of Georgia. Her name is Stephanie. I don't remember Stephanie's last name, but she couldn't work on the project anymore. I had taken her on as an intern, African-American woman, and it was so, I think she had never experienced anything like that. Yeah. Me, I'm a, veter I'm a veteran at it, so I just took it in the stride. <laughs> <laughs> but, but those are the kinds of things that, you know, this past year I've had to reflect on, but also the different way to reflect on the work that we've done over the last 20 years. Yep. So, yep. Um, I have one question that I, I want to ask before I go into the, the questions that are coming in, yeah. and it has to do with the 
um, uh, it, it, it has to do with the Princeton project, uh, mm. but it's a broader question about what you hope uh, that people take away from your work. And, and the Princeton project is, is you know, is, uh, is related to this because, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering, like, how you felt when they made the decision after you did your work, a trustee sees the work, mm -hmm. reads it, obviously is moved by it, and then makes the decision to remove the name from the school. So how did that, like, uh, what, what was your thought when that happened? Well, you have to put it in the context of, you know, there was the students went to the president's office, right? Small group of students, I think less than a dozen black students. They came up with, you know, a, a grant to do the competition. They then invited competitors. Um, and then when we won, the piece was actually called Double Consciousness, right? Um, after working with Af the Afro department, other artists, and even working with the students, it changed to Double Sights because this was another way that DuBose, um, you know, talked about this ability to kind of, you know, see, put the veil on, right? But it's the opposite. And then the students were still not, you know, we unveiled it and the students were still, you know, they're like, no, yeah, we don't care. Well, yeah. It's like, Walter, we, we're, it's not about you, but we want the name off. And uh, in the summer of 2020, I actually got a call from some of the students who were really, they were alumni and they were disheartened that, you know, this piece was up and that they still were, weren't doing anything. And I told them, I had just found out I had the Knight Fellowship and I actually was going to support them during the summer of having more protests at the site. And, and I was actually thinking that the students were going to keep protesting and they were going to take the piece down, <laughs> right? Because again, the students are like, you know, that's fine, but we want the name on. And yeah. so I, we, we were thinking that, well, maybe the piece will be temporary. And, you know, that summer went and those things happened. And it's for the first time, actually, for me, I felt that the piece did overreach, but I had no problem. If the piece was going to come down, I didn't feel, I didn't feel bad about it, if you know what I mean. I felt that it had, it's doing what it needed to do, right? And yeah. it's for the first time I felt design not being this precious thing, right? Mm -hmm. That we, you know, cause normally we make something like, oh, it's mine. I don't want to ever lose it. But for the first time to me, I felt that I was just part of a process, a process of trying to reconcile something that, you know, we, we just have a hard time doing. Mm -hmm. And I think if sculpture and landscape and architecture can help us with that, I mean, I think then it does it does its work. Um, so and, you know, it's I have to also say when I when I went and saw the piece the first time, the piece is gorgeous. That's the other thing. It's just really beautiful. I was just like, so that's the thing <laughs> that I was pulled by. It's like, I mean, the light and all. I mean, but it's just a really simple, beautiful piece. And. Yeah. So that's, you know, of course, you know, as an architect, you know, it's like, okay, how do I let go? And, and it was the power of the students, I think, and of that discourse that allowed me to kind of, you know, again, deal with that notion, you know, of making something beautiful, but also thinking about it can have a temporal, right, life yep. to it if it needed to. So, yep. Okay. Um, a couple of questions here. Um, here's a question. Have you discovered ways to critically engage the makers of your project, i.e. the contractors, craftspeople, builders, etc., in particular the understanding that black and brown workers built so much of the American landscape uncredited? Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a follow-up. The same person asked kind of a follow-up question, so I'll, I'll roll that into this. And that currently many construction sites remain segregated with white working class bosses overseeing black and immigrant workers. This seems an opportunity for designers. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's a really, really loaded but good question. 
Um, I mean, there are not, you know, that many black contractors and black builders. I mean, there's a few at the large corporate level, but there are very few at the small level. And what we try to do is at the local level, we try to find, uh, as we're going through fabrication, we try to find people of color, women-owned firms. I mean, you know, we basically go out of our way to try to bring others into the process that have been denied. And in some cases it works, but in a lot of projects, you know, between the insurance and the prevailing wage issues, you know, you have problems. But the thing that we've actually found that's been more powerful in a lot of the artwork is actually bringing in artists, other artists of color, to actually help train them to actually start making the work and helping out on big commissions so that they learn how to actually, you know, work within the culture. Yeah. So it's an ongoing struggle. And um, if you know of any good fabricators, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But here, in Charleston, I think, I think the Charleston project is a really good one where we, we know we have a lot of local artisans that we're making yeah. part of that project. Yeah. So, sorry. And where that project, I guess it's, those were mock-ups or those were pieces that were coming to the site. Is that, yeah. what, what's the status of that project? Well, the building pretty much is up. I think the cladding is, is being cladded right now. The fountain, I just got pictures of its foundation. It's going to be awesome. This thing is yeah. huge. Man. Oh, it's beautiful, it's, beautiful uh, project. Yeah. One of the scariest projects I've ever worked on. <laughs> it's got to be good. It's got to be good. <laughs> <laughs> got to be good. Um. So here's a person that just uh, uh, wants to make a statement more than a question, but maybe you have a response. Um, as, a, as a budding urban designer, I had the privilege of seeing your presentation in Macon when you won the Mayor's Institute competition. Hmm. Your work is poetic, inspiring, and beautiful. Thank you. Ah, thank you. God, you've been around a while then, huh? <laughs> That's 20 years ago. <laughs> Um, here's another uh, question related to the, the kind of construction and fabrication process. Do you uh, ever take part in any of the fabrication processes of your projects, or do you primarily focus on the just on the design process? Uh, it depends. Uh, we have a, a small maker shop here at my studio in Oakland, so we tend to mock things up very early, and then we go to fabricate. So in a lot of the cases, you know, we perform the mock-ups. Like for um, Double Sites, it actually lived in our studio for a long time uh, as a mock-up, you know, and so with the tech, full scale. <laughs> full and scale? I, just remember, I mean, I couldn't go up 39 feet. I think we had like 12 feet of it. Wow. But, you know, wow. I was more interested in the base. But I say that because clients would come in and they're like, what is that thing, right? And I've actually <laughs> had clients now who's like, we need to do something like that project because they saw it in the office. So the office is always these full scale things. And, you know, again, that's the part of art that it's really hard to bring into landscape and architecture is actually being able to sort of, you know, create the thing. Uh, and so that's the piece of the practice that, you know, we're really fortunate to have gotten to a place where we can actually, you know, get projects that are at relative scale. Yeah. And you seem like the projects that you, you've, done and are doing are, are quite varied in terms of the types of clients you're working oh, yeah. with the scale. I mean, the, you know, the scales go from quite small to, you know, to the, to the Charleston project. Yeah. Um, and again, I'm not showing our office work. So I think, you know, if yeah. people are interested in the work, they should look at the website because I'm only showing the work uh, as someone said that deals with the memory work. This would be the memory work as uh, yeah. Dora, I think Dora Johnson called it, who passed away a few years ago, but she came out and she gave a lecture at Berkeley because her family uh, was run out of town, I think, in the Midwest, and she was fighting to actually get a plaque that talked about lynching. And so she's one of those people who just been dear to our heart, you know, as far as talking about memory and the work that we need to do. Yeah. Um, another, another question. Uh, Starts off by saying, thank you, Walter. Um, I'm a big fan of your work. Um, just jump down. Um, and I'm honored to hear you speak. 
can you describe, uh, I'm sorry, it keeps jumping around. Can you describe your understanding of the landscape's role in the American landscape, how you approach its representation in your work, and further, how this may have changed throughout your career? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, for a long time, you know, I never really thought about, you know, the American landscape, when, the American landscape. You know, I went to school, learned landscape history, went to architecture school, learned architecture history, went to urban design. And when I went to Berkeley, I got really um, excited about J.B. Jackson. You know, I started reading Brink, you know, J.B. Jackson taught you don't know J.B. Jackson, a cultural geographer, Brahmin, very wealthy, <laughs> great writer who wrote about the ordinary landscape. And I would take these courses and I would read about, you know, these landscapes because he would just talk about, like, the road. Um, he would talk about the garage, but he would just talk about these ordinary things. And I was always taken by that. And then I had Paul Groth and then Spiro Kostoff. I had these historians and geographers who brought landscape to life, and it piqued my curiosity. And then I started thinking about, well, how can I talk about culture in landscape? I mean, how do you bring this to design? And that was the disjunct for me very early in landscape architecture was there were all these cultural geographers, <laughs> but there was no one figuring out how to bring that stuff into the work. And that's where I started you know, digging a little bit more for what I call the every day, right? And trying to say, well, why can't we celebrate the every day? And when you do that, it opened the door for me to actually see things in communities that I hadn't seen before that I could celebrate, right? And then as of the last 10 years or so, I've gotten more interested in colonialism. Um, and really trying to think and question how do we deal with this colonial history? Because I started finding that working in places like Charleston, working in places that Philadelphia that had this really deep colonial embedded history, it was really hard to get people to see the place in any other way. And colonialism is about sameness. It's not about difference. And so I'm at a place now where I'm 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 seeking difference more and more and and I'm teaching more about post-colonialism not with a hyphen. You know, post-colonial you can say the hyphen that means that we're in somewhere else but I think we're still in this moment where particularly in landscape architecture I think these there's spaces out there where heinous experiences happen. Yep. And some of them we celebrate and others we have erased and we think they don't exist. And it's through that kind of exhuming that kind of colonial history, which you're actually seeing in the last year with the Confederate monuments. You know, this is the same thing. And I just think this is the place in which I think we have to see the American landscape. I started out with some of those images, those segregation images, which I'm actually using for my hybrid book. But, you know, it stuck in my head that my parents could probably could not remove the semiotics of whiteness of seeing whites only from their mind. And I can't imagine having that embedded so that everywhere you went, there's a hesitancy. Yeah. But I saw it. I saw it in my parents. I saw it in my grandmother. I saw that hesitancy. I didn't have that hesitancy, but I had other semiotical things that, you know, forced me to act in a different way. And a lot of them had to do with those symbols right around you. And so the landscape, I think, I think that's our, that's our job right now, I think, to interrogate and begin to kind of see the other side of the semiotics that if you feel that, you know, you can get married in a plantation, you know, what is it that is allowing you not to think about the slaves that made the plantation? Yeah. And, and I think that's a real question about landscape. So yeah. I can go, as you know, I can go on about this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me try. I realize there's a bunch of questions stacked up here. Um, can you actually see the questions too? Uh, I can kind Walter? of see them. Yeah. I mean, if there's yeah. one of them that grabs your attention, that's fine too. But here's one. Um, I'll let you do it. While you've just while you've discussed permanent projects, 
Can you talk about the value of temporary landscapes in America that have been created as part of uh, Black Lives Matter protests and due to the pandemic? Say that again. Um, I'll just, uh, while you have discussed permanent projects in your work, can you talk about the value of temporary landscapes yeah. in America that have been created as part of Black Lives Matter protests uh, and as part of the pandemic? In other words, I, th I think she's talking about the, the kind of impromptu uh, uh, yeah, landscapes. Uh, I mean, I think those, you know, impromptu places like Black Lives Matter on the street, you know, the projections on the some of the statues. I mean, this is fodder for us. This is fodder for us creatives. You know, if if the civic response is that powerful, what does it say about us? We got work to do. We, we're the ones designing streets. Why didn't we come up with the idea for Black Lives Matter streets? So this is the stuff. I mean, I think when people go out, they're reacting to the landscape. We're actually making this landscape. And if we're not reacting, then we're part of the problem. So I think we can get inspired by some of these. I mean, I'm inspired by when I saw the Breonna Taylor, you know, projections. You know, we're making a piece now about projections. So this is the stuff that I, I guess that I look to when I see things coming out of a civic response. This is people. This is like having a community meeting, right? This is people telling you, you know, this is where the source can be. So I would push all of us as designers, educators, to think about, you know, how these temporal strategies, I mean, seeing people walk down a highway in LA in mass, that's powerful. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, when you kind of think about it, and, you know, we've done things like, you know, in Florida, getting a community to walk down the street, you know, as a community, because I just wanted them to see how hot it was without trees. <laughs> but this notion of putting people in space, I mean, I think can just be a powerful endeavor. So I think these are, these are amazing times, and I do think there's amazing fodder out there for us to build on ways in which we can think about a just city and a city that's inclusive. Yeah. Here's a question that kind of cuts off. So it kind of, I don't know what the question is, but it's somewhat provocative. Um, throughout the projects you showed, you often chose to represent historic figures, both figuratively and symbolically. For example, in the Woodrow Wilson, mm -hmm. the project on Princeton's campus, you represented Wilson and his contemporaries both symbolically through the columns and figuratively through the faces shown on the on the columns. It cuts off right there, but I think that's yeah, yeah. I think I know what they're getting at. People ask this question always. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I for a long time I stayed away from figurative work because I thought very early in my career that the best way that I could reinforce difference was through abstraction that I didn't want to keep um, kind of making these kind of representational things. But over time, I've gotten over that. Uh, <laughs> and I feel like now, at times, I feel compelled that I have to have representational imagery on things. And at times, I feel they can be more abstract. I do think more and more, I want to see more black images in space. Uh, Fred Wilson, a uh, wonderful artist, New York artist, did a project in Indianapolis a few years ago uh, where he, at the center of town, there's a slave being freed at where there's an obelisk. And he, I think he was stating that that was the only black figure in, pub, in the public realm. And he scanned it and he wanted to, to actually remake it and put the figure at City Hall. And the black elders just said no. And all the young blacks said yes. <laughs> and so this idea then of representation, again, is, 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 is a thing that we need to participate in. And we can't leave it to someone else. And that goes back to that image I showed you of Charlotte. Um, you know, I was taken aback by that image and I'm, I'm blown away that no one has critiqued the image. But those are places where we can find a critique of the image, but in certain ways, I want to own it to a certain degree, our images, you know, as you're actually seeing now in the virtual world. I think this idea of who owns those images can be a really powerful way, again, to reconcile our future.
I have to say, Walter, there's there's as many um, just comments of appreciation as there are questions, uh, but I, I feel like I, I want to read a few of them. Um, <clears throat> here's one. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Walter. Having a background in landscape architecture, I have been a big fan of yours. Uh, including black history and narratives is not an easy thing to do. You have done it very intentionally and elegantly. Uh, how can architecture best show blackness in this field? We've been having this conversation, a few of us, and this idea of muting architecture, right? I think my piece at a at MoMA, I was intrigued by this notion of muting architecture and using reflection. And so, you know, as I thought about my piece, it was like the architecture became subservient to the image of the individual, right? So it's just a shell. And more and more, I mean, I think the way that architecture can be powerful is to present us differently to the world. Right. Not in the same way. And I would argue there is a black semiotic for architecture. <laughs> and if you look at low low cost housing, <laughs> you look at planning and certain that there are certain expectations and they all look the same. It's defensible space. It's not part of the rest of the fabric. And so these are things that we might not call them black space. But if you interrogate them enough, you'll start to sort of see where to what to break out. Of. I would love it if every project that people of color was put in was different <laughs> and it reflected them. That would be true to itself versus the hope sixes of the world. Yep. And we know hope sixes is a brown architecture, brown and black architecture. And you go anywhere and look at a hope six project and it's not hope. It's not yep. hope that you're getting, you know. And so those are the I mean instead of a kind of an aesthetic, to me, those are the more infrastructural things that we can do as designers. We can begin to reject this kind of standardization of the semiotic that we put people in, right? Because we should know by now that it doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, how many projects do you need to do before you say, well, it doesn't work? And this is where the conundrum comes. If we keep doing them over and over, then does it mean that people just don't care? Right. And, and at a certain point, you have to get to that moment where they don't care. That's why they yeah. just keep making it the same. So. Here's another um, uh, more of a show of appreciation. I think it's I think it might be from a student. Um, uh, I am new to the architecture, culture and architecture. I'm just, sorry. I'm new to the American culture and architecture. Having. Uh, been studying J.B. Jackson, Spiro Kostov in my history classes. Today, I was fortunate to witness the practicality through your work. Thank you for explaining the narrative behind each of your projects. Your works are powerful, uh, extremely humbled. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Nice to have good mentors. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Spiro Kostov would give a lecture and, you know, after an hour, no one would leave. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, everybody would just stay there. It was just like, ah. Oh. But, you know, he was one of the first, you know, to talk about fascism, fascism in a way that you could understand it in his thing called the Third Rome. And it was, again, one of these moments that I had was, you know, we study things in architecture and certain things are off limits. Right. I mean, the politics of architecture it was just it was off limits. Walter, you, we've lost the sound. Oh, sorry, my phone. Oh, there, okay. um, yeah, I was saying that, you know, talking about things that are off limits, you know, cost off for me, gave, it kind of empowered you to look at things, even though they were politically charged, but there was something deeper that you could find. Uh, and I was just taken by him saying, you know, Mussolini was comparing himself to a Roman emperor. Right. And so you go like, ah, history. Right. And it's the same. Uh, I think we've gotten through a lot of the questions. Um, I have a uh, kind of a question that might segue into, a, you know, as we mentioned before we before you did your talk, 
uh, uh, Mario Gooden is, is, is doing a studio at our, at our school this semester, working with our second year graduate students. And he's, uh, he gave a great lecture at the beginning of the semester and um, has uh, helped us to bring the, the, the BRC, the Black Reconstruction Collective, down in a few weeks. So I want to tell everybody that we're going to be having that lecture uh, in about two or three weeks, so look out for that. But, and I know you're part of that group, and I, you know, I don't know how involved you are with them, but I'm, I'm curious um, if you could just kind of give us a preview of what, what, what's going on with, with you guys. What, what, what are you, you know, what are you thinking about? Uh, what is, what was the point of forming that collective? Like, what are you, what are you working towards? And, and what are some of the discussions you're having? Well, I think one of the kind of the first discussions we had was, you know, presenting your work in any institution, particularly an institution like MoMA, we wanted to make sure that we owned our work, right? And so the BRC is set up in a way of us being in charge of our own work um, and then being able to use that work to do further work <laughs> and that it's not beholden to MoMA. Right, it's beholden to us. And this was a moment where I think, you know, working with institutions forced us to kind of look at ourselves and see the power within ourselves. And so, you know, future work could be research, empowerment, but it gives us now a vehicle collectively to bring others in and to actually move outward and not have to have the museum right be featured. And I think that's kind of more central than anything. My participation. You know, some of the I've tried to, you know, I'm there supporting with BRC, but, you know, I my voice, I'm trying to keep my voice a little in the back because I want some of the younger voices to be much more upfront. Uh, and I do think this is the this is the work <laughs> of the elder to the youth. I mean, this is the way, you know, that we have to kind of think about um, the work over time that, you know, there are multiple voices. And, and sometimes, you know, younger voices don't get heard as much as some of the others. And again, I think the BRC allows other voices to filter through and not having the same voices over and over representing blackness. Yep. And I'm sure you'll hear more um, in a few weeks from the others. Yep. Question just popped up. Let me just. like the tower. Yep. Yeah. Do you want to you see that when you want to respond yeah, to that one? I saw that. Yeah. Um, I think the tower question was, can you talk further about towers and the relationship with capitalism and maybe expand on subverting existing power structures through a typology like the tower that comes from them? Um, I, I was I was interested in the tower because my office is in West Oakland and it's in a previous. Well, I would say it's in a redlined area. I won't say previously redlined. It's in a redlined area. And if you know redlining basically created neighborhoods of disinvestment. And in most cases in those redlined areas, they could not plan. To segregate them because that would be against the law, but they actually allowed uses to go in that were negative to the environment and to the life of people. So uses like sewage treatment plants <laughs> and industry and things like that. But within those landscapes over time, they become devalued to a certain degree that people who want to build something of value then never builds anything of value in those neighborhoods. And I watched for 20 years in my neighborhood along this one street where all of these nonprofits came in who are, their mission is to improve the lives of people. Not one of them built anything taller than six or seven stories. And as they're making these projects, I'm seeing 30 story towers go up downtown and that I can see. And I'm thinking to myself, well, why aren't we part of the city in the same way? And reading Adrian Brown's uh, Black Skyscraper really did um, inspire me to a certain degree, where she talks about, you know, the early days of the skyscraper in Manhattan 
and how very early in the low rise buildings that she was talking about um, in the tenements, they were highly racialized because you could see people. <laughs> you could see the Italians hanging out and immediately you knew the Italians are there. But when these towers started going up, people were like, who is in there? And from the tower looking down, you only saw a dot. <laughs> so that's the power shift. And so to me, black tower, black power is kind of flipping it, saying, OK, we're going to build these 30 things and, and we're going to be the ones in charge of the panopticon. We're going to be the ones looking down and we're going to be the ones in power. And you're not going to know it. Right. You're not going to know what we're doing in these things. And so in some of the towers, there's like, you know, music, there's like businesses and things like that. There's shooting galleries. I mean, there's all kinds of things that build on the 10 Panther. Uh, program and, and if you didn't know it conceptually that these things were going on in those buildings then that's that's the fiction that we were trying to get at and that's the power that we were trying to push because again you know we have um, these towers going up in san francisco all these tech towers and no one knows what's going on inside them but we know that that's where the power is like the salesforce just went up and it's like salesforce like you know, it's like the beacon of light, but no one it's the most ambiguous thing ever. Yeah. And so in a way, I'm trying to kind of I'm using the project to flip, but I'm also wanting the nonprofits. To kind of understand that critique, uh, you know, where I think, you know, for me, a lot of them is based on status quo, maintaining the machine, not trying to kind of look further. Yeah, yeah. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, any thoughts about hip hop urbanism? Any thoughts about hip hop urbanism? I don't know. I don't know what that is. <laughs> That's the life. I would imagine <clears throat> hip hop urbanism is the life of people in cities these days. Um, you know, again, in mm. our work, you know, culture is the thing that can inspire the work, but. You know, I don't want to get my eyes off the prize to a certain degree. And so, you know, we try to come back to these typologies, to these things that are real, right, and layer these things. Now, I'm inspired by hip hop. I'm inspired by jazz. I'm inspired by rhythm and blues and all of these things. But the key is how do I right, allow that inspiration to somehow take the work somewhere else? Yep. Yep. That's Harrison Fraker. That's my old dean. Why is he on this thing? Is, is that my own dean? That must be my old dean. Is Harrison that right? <laughs> I think that's Harrison. Is it Harrison <laughs> Fraker? <laughs> okay, Harrison, if that's you. <clears throat> <It's> funny. <clears throat> well, Walter, this has been great. It's been uh, uh, a very engaging discussion and, and a really powerful lecture and. Um, I know you are super busy uh, right now, and we really appreciate you taking time to uh, to give the talk and to uh, you know talk about your ideas and your work and your and just your thoughts on uh, you know on landscapes and on you know on the status of where we are today. Yeah, uh, really well, I appreciate. I hope it. I can contribute to the discourse that we're having now, and and I do think you know a lot of my students are like, oh, this is. Uh, Things are going to change. This is different. And, you know, we've been around a while and I just think we have to be very careful. Right. Um, it's, it's part of our history to have these moments of reflection, redemption of and then just go back to normal. Yep. Um, and I'm hoping to come out of, you know, the pandemic and, you know, the civil discourse that we're having in a better place. And I would just say to everyone. You know, I know things are have been trying and I know down in Georgia, you know, things have been probably more intense than they've been here in California. But I just think, you know, if if we think about. What we're trying to do in this country, you know, and if you think about a democracy and particularly the American experiment at a certain point, we got to deal with this duality. Yep. And this duality does exist and we see it in our politic right now, probably the clearest. And I think, you know, as creatives, you know, I think we have to help the rest of America possibly 
right? See ways in which we can embrace difference. And I do think, you know, we can do that through the spaces that we make, through the objects, through how we want to put people together in space, because that's what architecture does. Uh, and so keep up the good fight, everyone. All you students, the future belongs to you. If we could be of help in any way, <laughs> please reach out. <laughs> but this has been really nice to sort of um, be back in the South, and uh, I wish you guys all the best. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Walter. Okay. Good to see you, Scott.